So I know when people talk about Ukraine, you know, they tend to focus on what's happening inside Ukraine, but it's so much bigger than that. You know, people are missing the bigger picture. U Ukraine is a catalyst for global change. We, we are seeing, you know, phenomenal seismic shift in world politics and re really the transition to a multipolar world. You know, the United States for the better part of the 20th century and, and this century has, has been the global hegemon. You know, the U.S. dollar has been the world's uh, global reserve currency. Um, you know, you had, of course, before the U.S. dollar pegged to the gold standard. And then uh, later on, the emergence of the petrodollar, where 80 percent today, 80 percent of uh, global oil transactions or, or oil sales are done in U.S. dollars. Right. Fifty five percent of the, the world's um, reserves are in U.S. dollars. And what's happening in Ukraine is threatening that, right? So the idea was that, oh, we're going to go sanction Russia, right? They said, uh, let's isolate Russia. Russia now has 5,530 5, sanctions. So, you know, Iran used to be the number one sanctioned country. Now Russia is the number one sanctioned country. So 5,530 sanctions. Uh, the, you know, they, they basically banned energy imports, Russian energy imports in the US, in the UK. Europe can't do that because Europe depends on Russian gas. Um, and then, you know, of course, uh, on top of that, they canceled Nord Stream 2. They canceled that pipeline between uh, Russia and Germany. They tried to isolate Russia. Is that working? Is Russia really isolated? Because when they say the international community stands uh, united against Russia. What do they mean by international community? Let's take a look at who are these countries that are sanctioning Russia. If you look at the map, uh, you're going to see, you know, you're going to see a very remarkable picture here. Oh, so it's North America, Europe, Japan, Australia. Right. So basically, you know, the, <laughs> the triad, where all the capital is, where all the financial institutions are, the global north. So when they say international community, this is the international community they mean, <laughs> right? It's not very international, is it? It's basically the West. And then at the UN, they tried to, they tried to condemn Russia, right? The UN General Assembly on March 2nd, they, had a, 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 they adopted a resolution to condemn Russia. And of course, if you look at the vote, yeah, 141 countries uh, voted to condemn Russia. So the, the overwhelming majority. But you have 35 abstentions. Who abstained? Oh, look, it's China, right? China, India, Iran, Iraq. What do we have here? South Africa. Oh, look, Pakistan. So <laughs> India and China alone, you know, that each of them, that's over a billion uh, uh, people, their population. You add Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, South Africa. I mean, hey, we're, 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 we're talking about almost half the world's population, right? Well over, well over a third. How is that the international community when literally billions of people refused to condemn Russia? That's very odd. And then, of course, you had another vote uh, just a few weeks later. This is on March 24th, but demanding aid and, and uh, aid access. And again, overwhelming majority voted in favor, but in terms of... Um, the BRICS, right? So when we're talking about BRICS, we're talking about the, the world's emerging economies, the, the, the powers of the future, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. They're not on board. Now, Brazil, to be fair, did vote in favor of these resolutions. But you look at Lavrov, the, the Russian foreign minister, what's he doing here? Oh, he's in Moscow <laughs> with the Brazilian ambassador, with the Chinese ambassador, with the Indian ambassador with the South African ambassador. That doesn't look very isolating to me. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what kind of international community you're, you're talking about, but it uh, looks very Anglo-centric to me. It looks very Western to me and, and not very international, right? Goes further than that. Why are we shifting towards a multipolar world? Politically, countries are refusing to fall in line like good little poodles and lapdogs for the West, they're saying, you know what? We have our own foreign policy. You are not going to decide our foreign policy. Imran Khan, Pakistan's prime minister, even told the Europeans, because the EU sent him a letter, you know, they wanted him to rebuke the Russians. He said, are we your slaves? Are we your slaves? Very good question.
I, I, you love to see it. Global South countries standing up to the, to the West, don't you? <laughs> Are we your slaves? They would, like, they would like Pakistanis. They would like Indians and the Global South to still be European slaves. That's not happening. As a matter of fact, the day the war started, Imran Khan goes to Russia, meets with Putin, and buys 2 million tons of gas and wheat. That's a giant middle finger to the West. That is a huge middle finger. That's screw you. I am the Pakistani prime minister. I will decide what's best for Pakistan. Not somebody in Brussels or in London or in DC. They threatened India. Again, Pakistan is a nuclear power. One of the most important countries in the region. India is another nuclear power. Population of over a billion. They threatened India with sanctions. They said, oh, if you buy oil from Russians, you better not do that. Again, this whole Anglo-centric, this, this Western arrogance, do what you're told. Like as if India is some colony. India went and bought Russian oil at a discount in rupees and rubles. <laughs> wow. In rupees, rubles. So again, undermining the whole point of the petrodollar. Right? I mean, again, this is, th this is what's special about it. A lot of people, they're so confused. Like, yeah, so what? India always buys you know, oil from Russia. They have a long alliance. That's not the point. The point is they bought the oil despite the threat of sanctions <laughs> at a discount and in rupees, rubles. You love to see it. You love to see it. Not only that, the Saudis, Biden is trying to call them up. Please produce more oil, please, because we sanctioned Russia. And now the oil prices are through the roof. Hundred thirty five dollars a barrel, the highest since 2008. Please pick up. MBS, please, <laughs> please produce more oil. Same thing with the Emiratis. They won't take his calls. Your, when your client states refuse to take your calls, you know you're in trouble. So they refuse to produce more oil because, I mean, for their own selfish reasons, you know, apparently they want more help to kill Yemenis. That's another issue, which, again, I've covered separately. But they're not doing it. Not only that, Saudi Arabia is, is thinking of selling oil to the Chinese. <laughs> Here it is. Not in US dollars, in Chinese yuan, renminbi, in the Chinese currency. Wow. So we got the Indians buying Russian oil in rupees, rubles. Saudi Arabia might sell oil to China in the renminbi. I mean, this, this is really bad news. If I'm in Washington, D.C., if, if I'm in that crowd, I'd be very nervous right now. This is not good. This is really not looking good, right? And on top of that, you have the U.S. begging to get back in the nuclear deal. They've been sh you know, dragging their feet the whole time. Trump rips up the deal. Biden dragging his feet. Now, all of a sudden, please, we want the nuclear deal. Why? So they can lift sanctions on Iran and Iran can put its oil back on the global market and lower the prices, right? And of course, you know, Russia at the last minute, because I'm telling you, I'm one of the only people covering the nuclear deal and they were very close to signing it. But at the last minute, the Russians stepped in and they said, we want a written guarantee from the United States that when everything is back with the nuclear deal and you lift the sanctions on Iran, you won't put new sanctions on Iran for dealing, for trading with Russia. Right? So you threw this in at the last second. Now the Iranians, you know, they're, they're diplomatic about it. They, they don't blame Russia publicly. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's, I, I, they've made a deal together, you know, in back channels privately that they will wait until this Ukraine issue is resolved before the nuclear deal is signed. Because if they sign the nuclear deal now again, and keep in mind, Iran is in the deal. It's the U.S. that left. If they get Iranian oil back on the market, the U.S. can then screw Russia. Right now, Russia, Iran have the upper hand. Not only that, they've been telling us for years that Maduro is not the president. Apparently, you know, some people in, in Washington, D.C. and London decide who the president of Venezuela is. And they've been telling us, Nicolas Maduro is not the president. We're going to take your gold in the Bank of England. Juan Guaido, some guy that nobody in Venezuela has ever heard of, he's the president, apparently, right? 60 countries recognizing him. Now, all of a sudden, when there's no oil, the U.S. is sending a delegation to get oil from Venezuela. And who are they speaking to? Juan Guaido? No, because he's not the man in charge. The patron is Maduro. He is the president and he's the man in charge. That's why you talk to him and not to the puppet. And so Venezuela, which Bush sanctioned, Obama sanctioned, Trump sanctioned, and, and Biden is, is keeping that maximum pressure campaign going. 
Now they want Venezuelan oil all of a sudden. Now they want Iranian oil all of a sudden. It's looking very dangerous for the US right now. You have countries that are doing major energy sales in other currencies than the US dollar. And you have countries, you know, the US has sanctioned everybody. They got no friends left. This is, this is what is called shooting yourself in the foot. They, they thought, yeah, we're going to come in and we're going to be the big boss and we're going to crap all over everybody and we're going to isolate this one, isolate that one. Now you need them. Now you need them. And the Russians, they, they, they upped the ante. They said, you know what? Europe, you get 40% of your gas from us, from Russia. You're going to pay us in rubles. You want to sanction us and screw, screw our currency? We're, we're going to make you drive, shore up the currency. So every single day, the Europeans are sending between 200 to 800 million euros to Russia to buy gas. Right? 40% of their gas is Russian, a quarter of their oil from Russia. And Putin said, you don't pay in rubles, we turn off the gas. You don't go and make a ruble account at Gazprom Bank. Now, we will turn off the gas. So the Europeans think, no, we're not going to pay in rubles. Gazprom Bank is like, okay, you send the euros. We will convert them for you at the Moscow Stock Exchange. We will buy the rubles for you, driving up the demand of the ruble, and put them in another account in your name, and then send the payment to buy the gas. So whether you, the Europeans like it or not, they are buying that gas from Russia from a ruble account in their name. But Gazprom Bank does, does it for them, does, you know, takes the steps to, to complete the transaction for them. But it's in their name. Let's take a look at the Russian ruble. How are we doing? Oh, 84 to the dollar. So 18th of February, it was at 77 to the dollar. Now it's 84 to the dollar. So basically, it's regained most of its value since the war started. And that's, of course, the payments haven't even started yet. That's coming very soon, and it will go up even further. I mean, what are the Europeans thinking, right? You get LNG. They don't even have enough terminals for that. <laughs> so do you see how we're shifting to a multipolar world? You have countries in the global south, the, the, the new economic powers, India, Brazil, you know, the, the BRICS, of course, and Pakistan and Iran. They, they are giving the finger to the, to the Americans. They're saying, not only are we going to continue dealing with Russia, we are also going to reject your foreign policy towards Russia. And we are also going to keep buying uh, resources from Russia. And we are also going to do that in another currency than the U.S. dollar. <laughs> and, of course, we're not, we're not gonna, the Russians are saying we're not even going to sell you gas anymore in dollars and euros. It's going to be in rubles, which they could have never gotten away with a month ago, right, two months ago. But now, because the Europeans, they think that, oh, we're just going to sanction you into oblivion. The Russians are like, you know what? You're, you're going to, we're, we're not going to pay, um, uh, we're not going to give you any more gas for your currency. Not only that, this also makes sure that the money is in Russia. So instead of the Russians having an account in a European bank, the Europeans now have an account in a Russian bank. The money is also safe there. So they're helping to shore up the ruble. They're helping also uh, uh, to, to move gas and energy sales away from the US dollar to whether it's yuan, renminbi, or rupees or rubles. The, the West is shooting itself in the foot. So it was only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time before you know, we move to a multipolar world. But the United States and the EU have basically shot themselves in both, in both feet and sped up the process of de-dollarization. And, and the emergence of Greater Eurasia, the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, these countries, they, they're sick of, of being lapdogs for the West or, you know, be, being treated like lapdogs and falling in line. And they're now thinking that, you know what, we're not going to be as stupid as the Europeans. The Europeans want higher food prices. You know, Aldi Nord in Germany is saying they're going to raise food prices by 20 to 50 percent, butter, sausages, meat. Uh, you, you can go do that to yourselves. You want to pay $4 a gallon for, for gas? You can do that to yourselves. You know, we're, we are not going to be stupid like you. Uh, Russia is our neighbor. Uh, whether we like it or not, you know, that's, that's a reality. Uh, and we're not going to sacrifice our own economic well-being for you because you, you say so. And of course, this is why they try to overthrow Imran Khan, right? Try to oust him through a no-confidence vote. Uh, you know, and we covered that, of course, just, just earlier. Because they, they think that, you know, if you don't play ball, you won't sanction Russia. You, you criticize our foreign policy, we will come after you. This is not going to work anymore. 
This is not going to work. And right now, Venezuela, Iran, Russia, they have the upper hand. They have the upper hand right now. It's not looking good. If I, if I was in Washington, D.C. right now, I would, I would be really worried. I would be very worried. Oh, boy. They really shot themselves in the foot. Really shot themselves in the foot. Even Goldman Sachs is warning now that the U.S. is at risk of losing its dominance. Remember, barely 100 years ago, the British Empire was the largest empire in history, right? And just like that, almost overnight, the British pound went from being the world's de facto reserve currency to the pound. <laughs> Don't think that this can't happen fast. I'm not saying it's going to happen, you know, at the flick of a switch um, tomorrow morning, but they have certainly, certainly sped up that process. And this is why it's so important to see Ukraine um, for not, not just what's happening inside Ukraine, but to see Ukraine for what it is, which is a catalyst for global realignment. You know, when you have, um, you have uh, uh, Russia's foreign minister, Lavrov, going to India. Let me explain something to you. In the last weeks, many people visited India, right? Uh, you had ministers from Mexico, from China, from the UK, from Austria, do you think the Indian Prime Minister met with any of them? No, not one. Russia's foreign minister came just yesterday. Modi met with him. The only, the only foreign dignitary worth meeting with was the Russian one, which again is a middle finger to the US. We're not going to shun Russia. Actually, we're going to show very clearly that we're still with them. We have no problem with them. And of course, this is just a day after Lavrov was in China. Showing again that China is, uh, is uh, on board, you know, to continue its, its uh, uh, relations with Russia. I mean, they've really just pushed Russia into China's arms. They have, they have made sure now that, you know, the, the economic ties between them increase. So Visa and MasterCard, they said, you know what, we're going to pull out of Russia. We're going to boycott you. And the Chinese looked at that and they're like, you guys are stupid. And they just moved in with union pay. So now that's the Chinese equivalent. Union Pay just took over their market share in Russia and linked it with Russia's Mir system. And not only that, Venezuela, Iran, are in talks to link their payment systems with Russia's Mir. Once again, showing that they're going to, these countries, because they are sick of being bullied by the United States, will end up finding a way around SWIFT, around sanctions and coming up with their own systems. And you might laugh at that now, but you won't be laughing when they leave the West behind in the dust. And again, I take no pleasure in saying this. I'm just saying this is a wake up call because there comes a point you can't sanction people into oblivion and treat them like dirt, uh, you know, over, over every little thing. And I don't, I'm not talking about Ukraine. I'm talking about all these countries that have been victimized by sanctions and embargoes for decades, right? Which includes Cuba and Syria as well. So they're in for a rude awakening. They have pushed Russia into China's arms. They have, in a way, I know Pakistan and India and so on are, are, are you know, they prefer to remain neutral. That's why they've abstained and not voted one way or another at the UN. But you know, in, in essence, in practice, they are, in a sense, siding with Russia. They are saying to the US, we are not on board with you. That's bad news for Washington, man. That's bad news for US hegemony. And it's good news for the global South, sick of being oppressed by the same bully, subjugated economically, politically, by people in Whitehall and, uh, and Washington, D.C. So well done. You've threatened the, the United States dollar as the de facto world uh, 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 reserve currency and, uh, you know, uh, petrodollar. Um, <laughs> even the euro is going to take a hit in the long term because now major gas sales are being done in rubles instead. Uh, you've made sure that Russia... Venezuela, Iran, and China have closer economic ties to the point they're linking their payment systems together. Uh, you've made sure that uh, countries like, uh, you know, the, the BRICS, the emerging powers, uh, give you the finger politically and continue to deal with Russia like nothing happened. Uh, so you, you, you've you effectively pushed them closer to each other and drawn a line in the sand where they've said, you know what, we care more about our own well-being and our future than to just follow Washington, D.C. So well done to the so-called international community. Yeah, you're looking really united right about now, <laughs> right? The international community. What a farce. Again, 
I, I, I couldn't put it better than this. That's really what it is. It's just the West masquerading as, as, uh, as uh, you know, the, the moral arbiter pretending to speak for everybody else. The days are numbered. The days are numbered. And Lavrov himself, when he was in China, he said, this is the moment for the emergence of a just, democratic, and fair world order, a multipolar order. So if you need, if you, you know, <laughs> if you needed an official statement, you got it. But just from seeing the developments that are taking place, we, we didn't need him to say it or to spell it out. But even he did.